Good afternoon. It's a, a real pleasure, and thanks, Eliza, and everyone else for organizing this fine event. I've never given a presentation in bare feet before, but it's much more comfortable than wearing shoes. <clears throat> when I was driving up uh, yesterday, I realized that I was not very artful, and after all the other presentations, I had validation of that concept in, in total. Um, actually, the only time I was ever really artful was coming up with excuses in high school to play hooky on a day like today. <coughs> and I almost came up with some myself. <laughs> so this may be a beauty-free talk in the next few minutes, but please indulge me. Most of you know me as an impervious cover geek. But, you know, the impervious cover model, the 10% rule, all the computations for stormwater. But over time, I've realized that it's, of course, a mosaic of different tiles in the landscape. We have the forest tile, the turf tile, we have the uh, paved tile, we have the vacant lot tile, and we give certain norms to them professionally, and so do our neighbors. Those nor norms are usually different between us and them. Um, I happen to live in a very leafy suburb, so I'm not a city boy. This will not be a city talk, nor will it be an ex-urban talk. Uh, Catonsville is just outside of Baltimore. It's an old trolley car uh, suburb, so you could get away from the humors and vapors of the city and go into the country in the summer and escape that. But it's now over 120 years old, and most Americans live in some kind of suburb. This is my old house. Um, it's an 1840s house. And a couple of years ago, I decided, what could I personally do uh, to make an environmental difference? And I weighed everything up, and I thought energy efficiency uh, would be good. So they came in and did a blower door test of my house, and it set a record for draftiness of all the thousands of homes that they had ever sampled before. So I took care of that first, but I used that kind of as a model going forward. And it's a, if you own an old house, they're graceful and beautiful, but they're just a constant amount of work, and they have a lot of built-in problems. And the big problem I had was a flooded basement. Um, after every storm of an inch or more, uh, I'd get water in my basement, and a really big storm, um, a couple inches or more. And so whenever you see a sump pump in your basement, you know that your drainage was never perfectly designed. And for a guy known as watershed guy to have a flooded basement, that's kind of a, that's a bad thing to do. <clears throat> so I went out and checked my soils, and did, this was the post hole digger. And actually, because it's such an old home, it preceded um, excavation. And so actually my soil profile is about 12 or 18 inches of good soil before you get down to that rotten clay layer that everyone else has in America slightly higher up. Uh, so I, I realized I had some pretty good soils and I could solve my problems there. Um, now the boy in me likes big heavy equipment and excavators. Uh, the man in me realizes that that's probably not the best thing. Um, I think I mentioned before I'm not a very artful person, but I am Irish, so I know how to dig with hand tools <clears throat> and axes and so forth. I'm not very good with power tools. That's beyond my skill set. Uh, so I went out on a quest to uh, solve my problem. And the next picture I'm kind of embarrassed to show since we've seen so many beautiful uh, rain gardens. These are what my daughters call my mulch pits. Um, but I'm a brave enough of a man to show a late winter rain garden shot as opposed to midsummer. Um, a few areas of minor elegance, and I'm sure they're going to grow up in their next growing season. But it solved my uh, flooding problem in the basement. And it attracted the bees and the butterflies and broke up the habitat of, of my yard. And uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Actually, uh, for old men like me to actually move this much sand and mulch and dirt, I, I calculated it was over uh, 20 tons of material that I lifted at various times. And so I had a lot of aspirin that I ate during that period. <clears throat> so 
So it led me to the concept of homeowner stewardship in many different tools. So this is an overhead shot of my house, and you can see uh, my bioretention of rain garden areas, permeable driveway. But perhaps the biggest part of it is uh, conservation landscapes of mostly native plants, some mature trees. But just as Jane mentioned, there's some degree of turf that is important to have, um, not only for markability, but just uh, that's our archetype, <coughs> certainly vernacular. Um, then over the last year or so, I've been splitting my hiking between being in the Patapsco River Park with all the trees, but also walking around where my neighbors are and seeing the incredibly different preferences they exhibit and uh, by neighborhood age, by income level. And it's really true that people engage in some behaviors we may not think are great for the environment, but people generally do engage uh, to keep up their, uh, to be good neighbors, to have an attractive landscape, uh, all the factors that Jane just talked about. I also, as I was walking around realizing I might dig my own rain gardens, but I, there were a lot of people that didn't look like me that were primar the primary agents of the landscape that I saw, and that's essentially the lawn care companies, uh, whether they're professional or non-professional, but primarily Latino in our area, about 85 to 90 percent. And so I'll get back to that a little bit later, but again, there's um, differences uh, in norms. So, changing the topic, we in the Chesapeake Bay have something called the Total Maximum Daily Load, which is the first regulatory effort for non-point source control in the country, it encompasses seven states, and it sets a re pollutant reductions for sediment and nutrients 30 percent from existing levels from the urban sector and about 10 or 15 percent from the ag sector. So the lawyers got together and put this completely new regulatory tool to not only shift from our paradigm of when we do new development, we won't have pollution, but going back into existing neighborhoods and eliminating uh, pollution from those. And of course, lawyers being lawyers, they went, signed the agreement, went out to the bar, declared victory, but no one actually designed the rules of the road. How much does one BMP remove versus another? What are the qualifying conditions? How are the BMPs reported? tracked and verified, the Chesapeake Bay has a 64,000 square mile subwatershed. And so we're talking about thousands, if not millions, of BMPs. So it creates an enormous bean counting problem. The other thing that's notable about the Chesapeake Bay is that uh, when you look at the land use, there's 17 million people that live within its boundaries. 10% of its entire watershed area is composed of pervious land, turf. Homeowners own about 75% of it. To put that in perspective, it's equal in total to all the corn, wheat, and soybeans grown in the watershed. So all the row crops, we're paying the farmers to do BMPs, we have this huge 10% of our landscape, and what do we do with that? Can we reduce pollution? And the local governments are saying, whoa, we're going to have to spend at a county level upwards of one, two, three, five, ten billion dollars to solve this a conventional way by building big stormwater retrofits, big old ponds and wetlands, stream restoration practices, all that kind of great infrastructure, but expensive infrastructure to build. And so um, those options will still be used, but even if those options are used, they will not be able to meet their pollution targets whatsoever. So the notion came, can we build up a quarter acre lot at a time 
a half acre lot at a time, a one acre lot if it's an exurban area, and make a meaningful difference, and how can we motivate property owners to do so? So we had a bunch of expert panels come together, and my job was to manage their expertitis, panelitis. And I won't go into all the details except to say that uh, they used big words like hyperreic box, disproportionality, and so forth. And we learned a lot about how streams work, floodplains work, and what I'll talk about very briefly is uh, urban nutrient management. And so the panel and I went through the research, thank you, um, and looked at uh, what is the right lawn care practice to do. And this was a bunch of crazy scientists. We had turf scientists who think if God had an eighth day, he would have eliminated the turf and just made it all, or the forest, sorry, for my own joke, and replaced it with forest. <coughs> Soil scientists, just a whole group. Um, and the initial focus was on fertilization. But there's a lot of research now that indicates that it's how we manage our own biomass, whether we fertilize our lawn or not, that delivers nutrient loads downstream. Think of the grass clippings or the leaf clippings as a bag of fertilizer in their own way. Biologically, they act exactly the same, although the fertilizer is a little bit more quickly available. So the people out there, and many in the landscape architect world, are freedom lawn fans, where we would never fertilize or uh, do things like that, isn't always the solution. So they came together, and uh, the second bullet is the really important one. For only the second time in North America, the turf scientists agreed with the statement that it was okay to choose not to fertilize your lawn but in recognition that more than 60% of our watershed residents do, there are two other options of using less fertilizer uh, in smaller doses and monitoring the response. And it was kind of fascinating. The uh, uh, scientists found that lawns denitrified, uh, that the nitrogen turned over very quickly, and many lawns were more retentive than we thought. So there's this issue of what we call disproportionality, that 20% of the people cause 100% of the problems. So the, the expert panel came up with uh, high risk and low risk factors and to target on the high risk. And I don't, won't go into all the details. All the expert panel reports are up on our website. Uh, and so if you choose to fertilize, and I think this has been a just an outreach sin of the first magnitude. We send all these mixed messages about how to take care of our lawns from the Scots people. You know, the Masters Tournament is this weekend. It's the peak for the uh, ads for Scots and everyone else. And then we come in with these kind of mambly, pambly, red, fertilized less or something. So we try to get the panel to come up in plain English and hopefully someday plain Spanish, what uh, good lawn care means from a nutrient management standpoint. And again, for those people that choose not to fertilize, you're not off the hook. You can't be holier than thou. Um, your biomass has to stay on your lawn. Your leaves need to stay on your lawn and be composted. And then you have the opportunity, as I did, to use your lawn as a stormwater treatment area whether it's disconnecting your downspouts, rain gardens. I think rain barrels are a little bit overrated myself. But uh, um, <clears throat> so last December, our, a congressman went to the head of the Bay Program and said, you've got to figure out a system to, ha to credit how homeowner BMPs would be incorporated in the t pollution diet. How would they be measured? How would they be um, counted? And I go, wow, I don't really want that job, but I agreed to do it. So, of course, the first thing you do with bureaucrats is come up with a big flow chart. Don't try to read the flow chart except the very top. The whole idea is how can we get the homeowner, how can we get a delivery system where there's an individual homeowner has some incentive 
uh, because now the local government has an incentive to get credit for those homeowner practices. Because what I build for the county, they don't have to build themselves. So now they have an incentive in the system. And local watershed groups uh, have an incentive because this is a way they can create jobs and do water audits and help build them or uh, whatnot. And we have to have some tools to report them to the state and the state has to report those to EPA and that's the um, system that we're working with right now. We hope to have a pilot in Maryland uh, by the end of the year and extend this system baywide uh, in 2014. But this is a slide. Um, I try to use as few words as possible. But this is about multiplication and delivery. So far in your professional careers, you deal with well-meaning clients who want to do the right thing. We have to get to the people that may not be environmentally aware, but have an incentive to do so. Um, the first is local governments have decided and have implemented a series of subsidy programs where they will pay you uh, a rebate or they will pay someone else to build a rain garden. It went from one demonstration project five years ago to over 30 communities offer them. We have things called stormwater utilities pretty much throughout our watershed. Uh, homeowners are looking to get rate discounts in response to building practices that reduce runoff. So we're now getting some powerful economic incentives rather than just emotional and environmental incentives. Um, we are finding that it's really hard for ourselves to express to the homeowner how to do these. We've been working on something called a a guide to the design, construction, planting, and upkeep of rain gardens. Uh, and it's actually a collaborative process to put it together in a way that's understandable to the homeowner, uh, humorous, readable, and something they can do themselves and feel empowered to do. But without the design equations, the heavy engineering, quite honestly, the heavy plant lists, uh, all that stuff so that we can multiply it uh, we have a program um, of landscape contractor training, including uh, three different videos in Spanish on LID maintenance, inspection, and construction. Again, if 85% of the crews are Latino, uh, I'm still trying to figure out how you say bioretention in Spanish. It's, <laughs> I, I think it's bioretentional. But, I was so lousy in Spanish because I was skipping class. Uh, so uh, the other thing, we have techno technology now, uh, none of which I truly understand, but other people do. So the idea is can we uh, use that technology that I can upload my rain garden to the local government and can they upload it? Can we have uh, smart apps uh, for inspection so that we can inspect them and five or ten minutes or less? Can we have visual indicators that would say the bioretention area is too bushy and it needs a major makeover? And trying to translate that into terms that someone with a high school education can understand. And uh, so there's a number of those things that are going on. And uh, we're trying to collaborate with watershed groups and anyone else that we can. So really just in, in closing, um, I think that we are on the threshold, at least in the Chesapeake Bay. This photo is my, my fine colleague, Ann Gillette, from the LID Design Studio, where she can create beauty. I mean, this is not my mulch pit. This is a very beautiful, admittedly a summer shot, um, where we can push through a series of drivers that is the local need to get r reductions in pollutants, the watershed group need to have a paying role, uh, the need for jobs at lower income communities, uh, the economic interests of the homeowner, the 
can all align together that we can go into big time delivery of homeowner stewardship um, and just having 10,000 rain gardens in the bay won't do it but we have I believe 5 million households and properties so if we can get to a 25 percent um, penetration rate uh, we can collectively make a huge difference. And so that's the thing we're working on right now. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Tom. <laughs> Questions for Mr. Schuler. Shoeless Schuler. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just a well of questions, but I, I, I wanted to pose one question, and I don't know that you or maybe someone else in the audience might be the one to talk about it, but to me, a lot of this comes down to land use. And when we're talking about suburbs, we all know that that's not the highest and best use of the land, perhaps, in terms of humans staying more in compact development forms, that everybody has an acre or a five-acre parcel and that a majority of it is lawn. And, you know, I just, I see, a, I don't see that in the region that we live in as much as, you know, here in the, in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of, it makes me want to ask, um, why aren't we looking for models to create more density in these underutilized areas in terms of fitting more housing into existing neighborhoods? And the word NIMBY comes to mind because a lot of people would not think of having another mm -hmm. dwelling on their property. But given all the challenges that we have uh, can you imagine a scenario where we can start to institute different models in these neighborhoods where we actually have multiple dwellings, accessory dwellings, uh, you know, a, a garage that's a granny flat or, mm -hmm. you know, a caregiver lives with a couple or something like that or multi-generational um, habitation models that can we, as a country, start to get there? Because it, it seems like that would solve a lot of the problems that we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, one of the, we're dealing now with the sins we've committed in the past. The good news is the most recent surveys in the major, in the Bay Watershed indicate a, a migration back into the cities and back into the inner suburbs. And thank God, finally, the reversal of the exurban creep. Um, whether that is sustainable or not in the long term, I actually believe it is, but for other reasons, because of the demographics of Latinos um, uh, being a part of the population, more city dwellers, there's the, the gas and commutes and roads and congestion. Um, and I think uh, the next big area of infill are the inner suburbs that uh, because of their age, you know, from 1900s to in the 1960s, they are ready for that approach that you just outlined. Um, and I think communities are recognizing that they have to renew and restore their older residential areas and they can do so using green infrastructure, but also that densification is not bad. Um, So, Tom, in, uh, in Portland, we had a program that has been completed where we separate, we disconnected downspouts. And that took 18 years, and I think we did 50,000 homes. So, thinking of what, thinking of a million, which is less than 25% that you have to deal with, what are you thinking about the scale and the time that, and the staff needed to do this? Yeah, it's a, unquestionably a big job. But um, unlike Portland, we have um, 17 million residents, soon to be 18. We have 1,000 governments, local governments. And we finally have a regulatory system in place where there's some accountability uh, for actually getting the BMPs in the ground, whether they're the big BMPs, like the big retrofits, or the little retrofits. 
And what we're actually wor working on now is verification, because what has always confounded us in the environmental advocacy community is bureaucrats are great cheaters. They can show you things on paper that you would not believe. Do they actually exist in the ground? Can we verify they, you know, the big thing about homeowner BMPs is people change their landscapes every seven to 10 years, or let's say your wife leaves you, or, or no, uh, not you, <coughs> but <laughs> decides to pave over your rain gardens and spite you by sealing off your driveway, and that BMP goes away. So there's a, a companion effort to have uh, an initial verification, and then every three to five years, uh, a visual inspection to confirm it's there, uh, and then if you don't pass, you lose the credit, and so it's a little bit tougher to uh, to do that. But, uh, but you don't have a deadline for doing not the big stuff, but the, the residential stuff you're talking about. Um, or are you working on that? We're working on that right now. We're in the pilot stage, and. Next time I see you, I'll, I'll tell whether the pilot was able to get over the, the mountains or whether he crashed into the side and left a fiery crash. I have a question. You brought up the uh, companies, the advertising, and the tie-in with the lawns and this time of year across parts of the United States. I think that's a really good point because as Brian Orland here at Penn State likes to point out, you can unplug a plug and save energy but you have to unplug the person and change the behavior of the person. So when you're dealing with homeowners and fertilizing, wouldn't it be great if you could change the language of advertising where you're not fertilizing your lawn, but you're conditioning or you're maintaining or you're improving because it's a language set tied into human behaviors that's going to change homeowner fertilizing pollution, I think. Yeah, it's uh, all the sociological research indicates fertilization behaviors are deeply rooted, difficult to change, and uh, we have to change the neighborhood norms, and we can't necessarily just change individual, because the demographics, guys like me, 45 to 54, a little bit this, and uh, we're used to what, what we do. What they did in Maryland, though, and what the TMDL prompts a lot, pollution diet, prompts a lot of innovation is one state said, why the hell should we spend a billion dollars to construct practices to reduce nutrients when people are applying them upstream? So they just passed a law to ban phosphorus and fertilizer because we don't need it in our region. Uh, and they also had a law that commercial lawn care applicators could apply no more than nine-tenths of a pound of nitrogen in any one application. And so they took the consumer out of it. I was for like a, a P and an N band, but then they'd be selling zero, zero, zero fertilizer. <laughs> and even Scott's couldn't market that, I don't think. Can I ask you one more question? Sure. <clears throat> if according to you, we get 1.25 million, according to you, bioretention gariñas. <laughs> Are you worried about anything with the 1.25 million bioretention gariñas all over the place? Anything concern you? If I did that, I would be so proud that it happened. I, mean, I, I think what we're getting at is we talk about stormwater and water quality, uh, but I started out showing that slide in my basement, and the reason why people will accept rain gardens are the fact they attract pollinators, that you can plant medical marijuana in there. There's a lot of different <laughs> things that people will do that have nothing to do with stormwater or water quality, and we should not try to be heavy-handed water quality regulators about you're doing this for this reason. We're just creating a better kind of garden. I mean, think about it. If you want to do like a monster pumpkin, what better environment than a sandy loam thing that gets more water than ever? 
And, you know, come October, you can impress your neighbors that you've got the biggest melons out there. So 